Good afternoon, everyone from Dunrovin Ranch. It's a very uh, crisp and cold January afternoon. I'm sure it is not as crisp and cold as our, as is the ranch that we're, where Brandon hails from, the Hash Knife Ranch. Hello, Brandon, and welcome. Hello, how are you doing? We love having you visit us once a week, and we are all caught up in your three-part story. Uh, if people remember last week, um, Brandon had the sad but, um, you know, necessary responsibility to cut back on his herd because of Montana's drought this last year. The price of hay just went through the ceiling, and even if you had the money, there was no hay to be bought. So it wasn't even just a matter of money. It was a matter of availability, which uh, made, uh, made it uh, necessary for Brandon and his family to make some very difficult choices. And that cascades into another, uh, another a bunch of events. Once you uh, cut the herd down and you're buying hay in a slightly different capacity in a different way, it causes more trouble, doesn't it, Brandon? Well, it's, it sure precipitates some unseen things that you may or may not need to do. And when we, when we uh, <laughs> did that, and you're looking for hay, you're looking for the same thing you've always done. And you know what? Sometimes that's not available. And so something different happens. And then you go, oh, dang it. Yeah. Uh, this isn't going to work. Yeah. So you make it work. Yeah. You modify. Always you modify. Adapting. Always That's adapting. right. <laughs> So, Brandon, with that, uh, I'm going to ask James to roll your video, and then we can meet on the far side to see what it is that required adapting in this particular circumstance. Sounds good. Thank you. Hey, hello from the Hash Knife. Well, it's the end of July 2021. This has been a tough year, and... Uh, what I got behind me here is what I've got left over from last year's hay. And it's actually uh, some decent quality horse hay, so I gotta kinda hang on to that if I can. Uh, it's been a dry year and uh, it's been super hot. So the growth on hay fields, of which we don't have one, and always depend on others to purchase our hay from, has got limited growth. And uh, to the point where uh, a lot of guys that are really in it, really know what they're doing, are getting uh, maybe half of what they normally do, which consequently has driven up the price of hay. As you can see, this behind me here is my whole stack yard, and that should be about full by now, by this time of year. So it's a little bleak. I'm a little worried, I'm a lot worried. And uh, because it's been as hot and dry as it has, and we've had a lot of grasshoppers that have wiped out our winter pasture. The summer pasture is all native grass, and it's just not as palatable. To these stinking grasshoppers but our winter pasture has improved grass and it's it's gone so in order to save what we got as a herd that we've worked for you know several decades to uh to build up you know, about 30 years three decades or so uh that's just my wife and i not counting what my folks had done before and uh so we've got to try to save what we can but it's a gamble uh if i can buy enough hay at well it's over twice the price we normally pay for it, I can save some cows. But there comes a point where those cows are only worth so much compared to the price of hay. So, I found some hay uh, to the help of one of our truck drivers that brings it to us every year. But it's clear over in eastern Nebraska, if you can believe that. And uh, we're talking about 500 miles away or so, or better. And uh, he's gonna get us some. We need to, to be able to save our herd uh, to the best of our abilities by culling some of the older cows, keep, keeping the best we got, I need about 300 ton uh, to 350 ton because we got to start feeding here as soon as we get it right at the 1st of August instead of waiting till about, uh, you know, end of November or December. Anyway, we have to modify some equipment because this hay that's coming are big square bales. And uh, we're not set up to handle big square bales. We use these yeah, these roly-poly, roll them out like toilet paper rolls type of bales. But I'm going to take what I can get, and it doesn't matter. We're going to use some scrap that we've got here and a couple of pieces of good iron that I bought. And some spears, and I'm going to build a, a deal to put on the tractor so we can spear these bales and, 
and be able to handle them without breaking a bunch of twine and uh, actually be able to be efficient about it and be able to feed them off. So stay tuned for a bunch of cutting, grinding, welding, and cussing. So the first thing I've got to do is take this pallet fork that goes on the front of the tractor with an attachment and take these pallet forks off. They're very long and uh, you can't really skewer a bale with it. You can get under some, but you can't get underneath of it without maybe tearing up the truck driver's trailer bed, and I don't want to do that. And it makes it so we can handle them later. So I'm going to take these two spears that I purchased, and I got some new channel and some new 2 by 4 inch uh, box steel. And I'm going to engineer something here that I think will be able to replace these forks on this and use one piece of equipment and use a bunch of scrap iron for the feed off portion of this when we get to that that we've got around here and instead of having extra pieces of equipment that you could buy for about 700 bucks 800 bucks for a cheap one I can probably do this for about $300 and that's the $300 laying right there those two spears and a couple of pieces of iron believe it or not it's expensive stuff So the best thing to do is build your pattern off of the pattern that's already there. <laughs> and this uh, saved me a little bit of time. Just duplicate what we got so that it is able to be put on and off the same way these are. And that way I've got one piece of equipment for two uses and basically works the same way. I probably will not put that piece in there to lock it in place on the top of these uh, not a big deal I'm gonna set it down so that it'll set in there and the gravity will hold it down and then I can just pick it up and slide it when I need to a little bit more labor involved but a whole lot less um, again expense to get that piece and that uh, lock and then uh, not have to put it in and be a little bit more precise about it So I pre-cut this from the uh, steel shop to 48 inches. I'm going to know I'm going to use exactly half. That's half of my cuts. But normally I would turn this 90 degrees to get under here to make this a, a shorter cut across here with your surface area. But I can't get this underneath my blade. So ah, we do what we can do and we take our time. Here we go. Two cuts. So I've measured the center holes here and I'm going to put a just a little bit of a divot here. In each one of these where they're centered so that I can start the drill and punch some big holes to take the receiver portion or the bushing part of the spear. Yeah, I don't like that. That might have worked. Okay. Now to drill these out. 
Alright, uh, so I've got this piece of box steel and I'm going to drill through the top and the bottom so the holes are lined properly or straight. Up. Yeah, we've got a hole perfectly aligned. So, whatever we put in here now, when we do the hole saw, we'll be able to be much closer to a 90 degree angle to this. We hope. <laughs> so now i got to put together a mount for the back of this. I've cut part of this off and I've left some relief here so that I can get this portion. Um, Back of the mount sits like this and we want it to sit over the top and be able to slide and move but not come jumping over the top so i left some relief and i'm going to weld this to the top of our box steel and create hopefully a good solid mount well hang on I hope, and I have no idea in the world if this is going to work or not, but just kind of some ranch engineering here. I need to pull this back about like that. So that sits like that, and that plate comes up behind here, and this just keeps it from tipping forward. So we'll get a couple of these made up and see if we can get them to stick with a hot iron and electricity. I've tack welded on the corners here for my top mount and now I'm just going to kind of finish these welds up and do a more of a custom fit. It's not pretty, but it should be stout. I may overlay a, another strap over the top of this to give it some added reinforced strength because this is going to be the weakest point right here. And we'll see what we can do. Make that stronger or even bring it this way and over the top. Get some stability in there somehow. All right, now I'm going to use a cutting torch and take a piece of scrap that we've got here and uh, this plate about almost half inch thick I'm going to put it on the top of that mounting bracket that I said we needed to reinforce I think I'll just do a whole plate across the top since I got this here it's a good chunk and uh, see if we can't make this thing really stout Metal with fire just never gets old. So, I'll just bang this off of here, clean it up, and then we will weld it on the top. Well, you notice I've got a plate welded on top of here, and now I'm going to put a cap over the top of that and down each side just for some added protection on the front of this to kind of give it a little bit more strength. Uh, I'm known for 
building stuff that a nuclear blast couldn't take out, so I gotta I gotta maintain a rep here. I think that's going to hold. Okay, time to heat this guy up. And bend him over. All right, do the same thing on this other side, and then we'll weld them, tack them down. And we should be set for that one, and now to build the other one. Okay, we got one on, and here's our last one. We're gonna fit it up. Got pretty tight tolerance here, which we want. We want to jump around all the place. Spear in our bushing. You see, I've welded these bushings through both sides, and now we can attach our nut on the back, hold these guys in place, and then we'll go see if we can pick up the bale and see if it fails or not. Here's this is kind of testing by doing, and uh, it will be interesting. I think we're going to be good. Everything's solid. I'll hook it up on the tractor and see what it can do. So here we are, coming into the stack. Let us see just how good a job we did here. Fingers crossed. This is kind of a ratty bale, one that kind of got tore up, so this is kind of a good test to see whether it's going to hang together or not. So far, so good. Should be a little easier because I've got no grapple forks in strings. I can just kind of set it down, cut the net wrap, and just dump it in. Look at that. Nice. Like it when something works. Now, bring on that hay. All right, we're gonna try to take two at a time here. 
be a little bit more efficient and that'll be a good test to see if this holds up go nice and slow A lot of weight, feels heavy. That's, these bales are about 1,400 pounds, I think. So that's about 2,800 pounds right there. All right, we'll build a stack. Well, that didn't stack too bad. I uh, hurried up, got that unloaded so that man can get himself home. He hasn't been home for a while. He's driven two days, 1,200 miles just to get this hay to us. So. It'll stack better than that stuff does, but it won't feed off as easy because we don't have a way to feed it off yet. So I'm going to have to now devise something and scratch the noodle a little bit to figure out how I'm going to make a Godivus to feed these off since uh, <laughs> we don't have one store-bought. Well, we'll see how we do that. Brandon, that was so interesting, and I'm always amazed at your creativity. I just, <laughs> I know it's an essential part of being a rancher, but it re really does require a lot of problem solving. Well, it, in this case, it wasn't so much creativity as more as it was uh, copying, you know, kind of a design and just trying to improvise it and use a piece of equipment I had in another way. So, you know, I think the cheapest, I, I looked around for a bale spear and a really flimsy one was about $800. A good one would have been about $1,200, $1,250, somewhere in there. So, you know, why have an extra piece of equipment laying around that you're not going to use all the time? Why not use one and change, you know, some of the things on it? So that was kind of my motivation, that and being cheap and, you know, <laughs> trying to get the job done because, uh, you know, every every dollar you spend on that, unnecessarily yep. is money that is not going towards hay. And that's, that's an issue. So um, the next, I think next week's we had to get a little bit more, a little more creative. And I really had to, to uh, do some thinking on it and you'll see that, but you'll notice when I was taking the measurements on that to begin with, the, the light wisp of smoke that comes out of my ears when I'm thinking hard, you know, <laughs> No, I'm I'm continually impressed at, at your problem solving abilities, uh, Brandon. And I had some questions about your shop and about the use of all of these various parts of uh, of the equipment. This is uh, the second or third time that you've taken us into your shop. I mean, I remember you fashioning a door handle for your truck, and okay. and I wanted to kind of point out some of the variety of equipment that you have there and how often you use it could you talk about that what are really the essential items in your shop you know the things i use the most um and they all kind of get used at the same time depending on what you're doing like you saw in this this video was a chop saw for a metal metal chop saw mm -hmm. um you know of course you've got tape measure you can't do anything without the tape measure i you could use a piece of string you know, you could go old, old fashioned, old school right. and, and do something like that with some knots in it and, and get your measurements. But, uh, you know, your, your hand tools are essential. Um, with that chop saw with metal usually comes the use of a welder and a cutting torch, just like you saw, uh, a drill press, uh -huh. uh, you know, I mean, and it's, there's small things that you use that it's really hard to do without, like even a, a clamp or a pair of pliers, a lineman's pliers, um, you know, they're essential, especially when that metal's hot and uh, or really, really sharp, you know, and you're trying to uh, get an extra set of hands there that, you know, if I was using my own hand or, or my wife's hands, they can move where clamps don't move unless you, you know, mess them up. So there's some there's some handy things there that isn't just to be able to do it alone, but to be able to be accurate with things, too. So 
um, God, I've got to, you know, we should do that. I should clean that shop up so it doesn't look quite so bad. And then uh, take you on a tour sometime of all of the different things that we've got, you know, and, and what you use and um, table saw for wood, you've got um, miter saw, compound sliding miter saw. You've got hand tools, you've got hand planers, you've got sander. Uh, you never know, you know, when you're going to need something. And the, the toolbox alone is um, a big chest type one that uh, was mostly my dad's tools. And when we took the ranch over or bought it, um, you know, the tools came with it. So there's tools that my dad used when I was a little boy handing him tools, you know, so, you know, it's, there's some, some old stuff. There's some of my great or my grandpa's tools in there, you know, they died and, you know, tools just, they, they show up, you know, they just kind of get dropped there. And so there's tons of stuff. I mean, I was using an, an ads the other day just to kind of drag through the ice uh, to kind of break the ice up a little bit. You don't use that very often, but you know, when it's there and it's handy, Hey, go for it. Chainsaws, you name it. You know, I would really love to have you do that sometime, take us through your shop. And I, I really am curious about how old some of these tools are that have come down through the generation, including, I would assume, some of the large uh, uh, drill presses and, and things of that nature, because I have heard, although I don't have firsthand experience, that some of these tools that were made 50, 60, 70 years ago have had long durability. They just keep right on working, and there's really just no need to replace them. They do simple tasks, but they do them well. Yeah, no, that's right. And, and sometimes the old uh, hand tools, for instance, there's a difference between drop-forged hand tools and stamped hand tools. For instance, like your box end open end wrenches and a, a stamped hand tool will stretch. It'll, it'll move a little bit. It'll, it'll be softer. So it does not hold its uh, tolerance to get on like a, a nut or a bolt where a drop forged steel type of uh, wrench will hold. It's, it's, it's more brittle. It's more solid. It doesn't move as much. So even the quality of tools when you buy outright, you know, 70, like you say, years ago is, you know, their quality. They still... As long as you haven't abused them, they will still, um, you know, do their thing. So, and then of course, there's a few tools. I, I laugh sometimes. I, my, my dad, my grandpa, uh, particularly my dad is always modifying something and I'll run across a tool somewhere and I'll look at it and it's got some torch marks on it and it's got a, it's got a twist and a bend at the right angle. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> what do you use that for? And I, I had to devise a tool one day out of a couple of sockets and I, I had to go to Billings anyway, and I just grabbed, went to a pawn shop, and I grabbed a couple of the sockets I needed because John Deere wanted to sell me the tool for a little over $200 to get a starter off of a tractor. And I made that by going to a pawn shop and then welding together two sockets and was able to do the same thing. But um, in doing that and then kicking around after I'd done it, I found where my dad had done the same thing with another, it's a different way to do it. And I went, oh, huh. Come on, Dad, why didn't you tell me that earlier? Save me a trip to Billings. <laughs> so it's funny how, how you know, things happen. I, I, there's got to be a little bit of genetics in there, you know, where if you're going to gonna try to modify something to beat the man, hey, a more power to you. But, you know, um, there's more to that than the genetics, Brandon. You worked with your dad in the shop. He gave you the confidence. He had you working with him. You uh, gained a lot of experience, and you watched. You watched him do this problem solving. And don't you think that that's just sort of part of what's passed on is both the attitude, the confidence that, you know, I can solve this problem, and then kind of the know-how. Yeah, there. I think there is a lot to that. I mean, you could you could uh, take the easy way out and you know go to town and buy it or have it done for you. Uh, show somebody what you want. They'll take some measurements, and you could have somebody fabricate that and pay a lot of money because those are skilled people doing that. Or more importantly to me is the being able to problem solve, and it's about critical thinking and and what kind of tools will work. Uh, you'll notice I used a piece of box steel or not box steel, but a big heavy channel iron on the top of that box steel to make a kind of a, a ledge and a hook. And the reason I chose that is on the corner of it is much thicker because of the way it is manufactured. Well, that's going to be your weakest point. And if you've already got a beefier piece of metal there, that's going to help, you know, with that, that strength. So there's, there's thinking about 
how can this fail? How can I keep it from failing? And sometimes you don't, you, you know, and you change your, your uh, direction while you're doing it. You'll notice when I, I had the channel iron, the big channel iron, I, and I dimpled it for to, to stamp that, I thought I was going to have to make this stronger than I did. And uh, so I actually didn't put a piece of channel on the back of those square uh, tubing or, or, or square box steel because I didn't need it. So I modified it as I went along, and it worked perfectly with uh, not as much beefiness to it. And, I, and Lisa gives me a bad time constantly that when I build something, a nuclear blast is not going to take it down. Everything else will be leveled, but it'll be standing. So. <laughs> uh. You know, my dad was exactly the, the same way, Brandon. He spent 45 years in the mines, and when you fix something, you fixed it right. That's for darn sure. And I remember him building bunk beds in our cabin, our Dunrovin cabin near Great Falls. You know, you're going to have to – I went back there years later, and the people said, we can't get them out. <laughs> we'll have well, to, I, we'll have to you know, and if it builds – if you build something and it doesn't hold together, that's almost a reflection on your ability and your thinking, yeah. you know, yeah. so you make that thing so it's going to work and it's going to be strong and hopefully efficient. You know, you're not, you're not just doing a bunch of useless work uh, or putting in useless work and wasting resources while you're doing it. Absolutely. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about the differences between round bales and uh, square bales. And um, I'm thinking about four different um, types of, of bales. You've got round bales, you've got square bales, and you've got large square, bear, square bales and small square bales. Could you tell me what are the advantages and disadvantages and, and why do we have this wide variety of bale types? <laughs> That's a good one. When I was a kid, I was past the time of putting up a lot of loose hay. And they still do that in the big hole around the wisdom country. They've got beaver slides and they, they put it up, you know, and they can use horses, but they're mainly, I think using tractors, but putting it up loose. And there's some real advantages to that. Cause it, you know, really you can put that hay down and it'll shed the water mm -hmm. and it really preserves that even though it's loose, it preserves it cause it runs off. Um, when I was a kid, there were small squares of, you know, depending on how you put them together, uh, anywhere from 55, 60 pounds to, you know, a hundred pound bales. Mm -hmm. And they were square and about, you know, 50 inches long and they're inch and a half or a foot and a half thick, two foot wide, usually had two strings on them or two wire ties. And if it was wire, those things were heavy because they were, you could pack a lot into them. You have a kind of a, a limitation on your strength of your string to hold it together, but wire will hold but it is a pain to move and it, it, it hurts. You know, I mean, these bales are well over a hundred pounds. So we always use sizal twine. Now we're using plastic twines um, on the small squares of which we don't use that much. I think you use some, and I do some for some of the horses that are up close that I'm caring for really close, um, really good solid horse hay. But when you're putting out a lot of hay, that's very inefficient to do that. And that's how we used to feed. I used to get up on the back of a pickup and, kick one of those uh, bales off, grab another one. We'd, we'd kick off, you know, three ton of hay of a, of a morning or four ton of hay by hand with that method. And, and you got to you learn how to have a big old wad of string in your hand and not lose it out in the pasture. All of that goes with that. So those are what most people commonly call idiot cubes because you've got to be an idiot to handle those things. You know, they're, they're labor intensive. Um, I started stacking with those automatically, and th that, was a, that was a godsend. But then uh, come around uh, a few years later, when I was in high school, you started to see round bales, which are really nice, but they're all, you, you have to have equipment to handle those. And uh, so we have a piece of equipment on the back of that pickup that you'll see next week where it picks up the bale, the round bale, and puts it on the back. And you can actually haul two bales that way, and you can just set them down, cut the strings or the netting, depending on how they're put together, and then just unroll them like a roll of toilet paper. You just let it roll and uh, roll it out for them, which is pretty handy. Uh, there can be some waste to it because they'll stand on the, on the uh, hay that they're eating on. And so that's not always real conducive. The, the small squares, they would gather around it and not stand on it. There's an advantage there. Um, the round bales are typically 1,250 pounds or so for the grass hay. You can get up there 1,300, 1,400 pounds on some really heavily packed alfalfa that we don't necessarily use but um 
you know, you can get some, a lot of hay packed in those. They stack them in such a way that um, sometimes you have more waste. If you see them stacked up like a pyramid, the water sheds off of them, but it sheds onto the bales below them. And you'll have a lot of waste with those. There'll be a lot of rotting that takes place. So that's a, that's a disadvantage. Um, and then you move into the big squares and there's two different sizes of big squares. Uh, some of them are, are three by three or two by three and some are three by four. And the ones we got are three foot by four foot by about eight foot long. And so putting those up same way, you saw how we did it with the spear. I spear them and I set them down and you can stack those. And they actually, I'm finding they stack very, very well. I like to stack them like uh, you saw. Uh, and you'll see, you, you remember in the very beginning, you saw a long tube of which looks like a big sausage roll of the round bales. Those bales are two years old now, and you can actually pull those bales off, well, or a year and a half, and you can pull those bales apart because I stacked them tight end to end, and that grass is absolutely beautifully green. So that's the best way to stack them, not in a pyramid, but laid out. Well, the big squares, you can just stack on top of themselves and have less waste, but they're a pain to handle. It's all about how to do it, and a lot of people grind their feet. They'll throw those bales in, grind them, and uh, like us, uh, which kind of a little foreshadowing for next week. I had to use a, a cutting torch and, and <laughs> welder and chop saw and all kinds of stuff and uh, trying to modify what we already had with our bale handler to accommodate these squares. Didn't work too well, but I got it to work now. So I'm using using the bale handler to, to load them, and then I devised a little bit, something to kick them off of there by myself. So that and and be able to do it remotely from the cab of the pickup and uh it's really nice to do that it's it's a it's a big thing for us to not have to get out around those cows that are hungry and you know you can get you can get trampled you can get pushed around because those cows are competing for hay they're kind of like horses only they're more belligerent you know <laughs> well, um well i'm most familiar of course with feeding horses and when i talk to my hay guys they always tell me that the smaller 85 pounds to 100 pound bales are what they put up for horses. And that's primarily because there are lots of small uh, ranchettes that are using, you know, a, a small number of, of bales. But for cattle, uh, what is the disadvantage of a round versus square. I mean, your your producer in Nebraska uses uh, makes square bales. Is he targeting a specific market when he does that? You know, I I don't think so necessarily. It's just a, a better way to stack the hay and preserve it. It does stack better, and it and it does stay better. Uh, truck drivers like it because they can stack those straight up instead of having round bales mm -hmm. uh, and they and and being able to tie them down and get them to hold better. Um, anytime you're dealing with a square, it's much easier to handle than it is a, a round, anything around, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's a, a main thing. But the uh, I think that maybe some of the disadvantage, and I've looked into it barely, uh, the round bales are, or balers are very, very simple. They're They're kind of a neat thing where they just roll that, you know, have a bunch of bands, like a bunch of rubber bands in a row, and it just rolls that hay up into a little, into a ball, into a uh, cylinder, where the big squares are like the old square baiters, the small ones where they have a, a hammer that just comes in and it's called a plunger, and it just keeps packing it tighter and tighter in a chamber. And so um, I think there's a lot more moving parts to those, most likely, but um Again, I think it's more the convenience of the stacking, the preservation of it, and then being able to handle it. You're handling it with equipment anyway. You know, handle it with equipment that you can really stack it up and, and do some good with it. Well, Brandon, as always, this is so fascinating. I really, really appreciate your sharing all of this with us. And frankly, I'm looking forward to part three because <laughs> I, I want to know how this whole story uh, ends. And uh as kind of a parting comment, I'd like to say it has to feel very satisfying and, and it has to be almost fun to uh, attack a problem and, and go through all of those steps and to see it work on the other end. There has to be some self-satisfaction in all of that. Yeah, there, there is. There's, there's almost a little bit of a, a self-competition in a way. It's like, okay, how can I make this better, easier? Uh, my dad, we used to joke about him uh, he had a very, very keen 
like an engineering type mind. And he was always trying to automate something and make it easier or better, you know? And so if you could think of something that the old man would go, Hey, what made you think of that? You knew you'd done something. So <laughs> it's, he's not around, but now I'm trying to trying to stay ahead of my kids and make them think that I'm smarter than I really am. So <laughs> there, the satisfaction is, is there, but it's, you know, it, in, in a way you beat yourself up too, because if you're running short of time, something happens in the middle of something, um, there's a crunch there. It's, there's some desperation that, Oh my God, I got to get this thing done. Cause you know, I got to get animals fed. It's cold. There's winter. Um, I've got a truck driver that might be waiting on me. Um, you don't want those things to happen. So, you know, if you've got the time to do it, you've got the time to think about it. Yeah, absolutely. There is a lot of satisfaction to it, but there's at the, at the wrong time, it's, it's desperation too. Yeah, you know, I think that's one of the things that people in agriculture don't always understand. It looks like a relaxed lifestyle, and it can be anything but. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's, you know, I'm surprised more people in agriculture don't have ulcers. I mean, because you're, you you don't, you never put it away. You know, you're, you're it's there 24-7, and you're always thinking about how can I make this better? How can I be more efficient? Uh, because efficiency really is about uh, making the bottom line work. And if, if you can't, you may go, you may go broke. And sometimes, you know, you're trying to fight things that are not in your control. So you're trying to adapt to them so that you can make something better of it. And it's, yeah, it's, it, 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 it seems like, uh, you know, we should be walking around with a, a hayseed hanging out of our mouth and, you know, kind of kicking the dirt and saying, ah, shucks. But it may look like that, but you're like a duck. You're calm on the top of the water, but what's going on underneath is frantic. <laughs> well said, Brandon, as usual, a great analogy. <laughs> well, Brandon, thank you very, very much. And we look forward to seeing you again next week and say hello to your lovely family. Uh, give them all a hug from us. I will do that. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next week. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thanks.